Hello, friends. This is Jason, your favorite storyteller, bringing you another exciting tale only here at Sorry What. Today we have a two-part story, and this one is going to be good, I promise. Now drop that pitchfork, grab your favorite drink, and let's begin. Throughout the first half, the game had been a nail-biter with the lead changing at every possession. Lubbock High would score, then Ferguson High would get the ball, and Ferguson's quarterback Danny Keel would lead his team into the end zone to tie the game. The leaded seesaw it back and forth throughout the first half, and every time Ferguson had the ball, the Jag staff would pause what they were doing and watch Danny direct Ferguson toward the end zone. Camp Humphrey Korea was 15 hours ahead of Dallas, Texas, so the game that everyone was watching on Saturday afternoon was taking place on Friday night in Texas during the Texas 6A state championship game. The game was being shown on a 90-inch wall-mounted monitor being cast from LTC Grant Keel's cell phone to the Apple TV tied into the JAG office app system. During the second half, Ferguson started to pull ahead, and by the time the two-minute warning was given in the fourth quarter, Ferguson was comfortably ahead by a score of 48-38. to The game was not yet over, and anything could still happen, but it was looking good for Danny's team, and that is exactly how the game finished, with Ferguson ahead by 10. Danny threw for 275 yards and four touchdowns, with one interception off a tipped ball. The Jags staff was working on Saturday to prepare for an upcoming Inspector General visit, and although they were overdue for an IG inspection, LTC Keel was not overly worried about this one. Still, there was always the niggling doubt that someone had overlooked obtaining a signature or getting a timestamp on a document. The Jag office had declared an all boots on the ground Saturday to ensure they were as close to perfect as possible. This inspection was even more important than most because it would be LTC Keel's last visit from the IG, due to his upcoming retirement from active duty. Grant had originally been scheduled to retire in three months, but it was decided that the IG inspection would be the perfect springboard for a change of command, so shortly after the inspection, he would be flying back to Conus to begin out processing from active duty. Only his brother knew of his change of plans, and Grant was excited to see the look on his wife's and son's faces when he arrived home. Grant's staff was cheering his son's performance and clapping him on the back as the students, parents, and fans rushed the field after the final whistle ended the game. It was pandemonium on the field as everyone began hugging each other and jumping and dancing around the field. When the Jag staff saw the slim gorgeous brunette throw her arms around Danny to hug him, the cat calls and whistles in the office were almost deafening. Everyone had seen LTC Keel's spouse's photos on his desk and was envious of his sexy, beautiful wife. Cat's sheer exuberance and joy were written on her face as she hugged her son after his stellar performance. The crowd that had rushed to the field was celebrating by shouting, laughing, and crying, usually simultaneously. What she did next, however, caused the cat calls and whistles to stop and the entire office to become quiet. Cat jumped into the arms of Randy Kane, the Ferguson head coach, and threw her arms around his neck and her legs wrapped around his waist as she deeply and passionately kissed the coach. She was clad in black jeans that looked like they were painted on, a white tank top, and black boots with three-inch heels. She had her ankles locked behind Kane's back as they kissed on the sidelines. LTC Keel stared at the screen in disbelief as the staff of the JAG office looked away in embarrassment. His son Danny was tugging on Kat's top as Kane released her, and she relaxed her legs to stand in front of him, her arms still around her neck. Grant stopped the stream, closed Safari, and sat at his desk, stunned at what he had just seen. What his entire staff had seen. The blatant disrespect shown to him by his wife and his son's football coach was unconscionable. Colonel, are you okay? Captain Lynn Dunaway asked. Grant looked at her and shook his head. It's not just that she's cheating it's that she's so flagrant about it. He was truly at a loss for words. Captain Dunaway grabbed Grant's hand and pulled him out of his chair. You need to get some air, she said as she directed him out the back door and into the small parking lot in the rear of the JAG offices. Grant knew he must have presented a pathetic sight as he stood in the chilly Korean mid-morning sun, with tears streaming down his face. What? The? Ducking? Duck? Captain Dunaway said. Jesus, Colonel what she did that's royally ducked up. As Grant stood there trying to come to grips with what he had just witnessed, his phone dinged with an incoming text. Danny. Wish you were there. Awesome game. We won 48-38. I threw four 275 and 4 TDS. Grant looked at his phone debating how he should respond. Captain Dunaway could read his thoughts, however, because she grabbed his wrist before he could return his son's text. Text back like you normally would. Don't say anything that can come back to haunt you. Grant nodded his head in agreement and responded. Dad. That's great. Wish I was there too. Great job. He received a thumbs up emoticon as reply from Danny. How long do you think it's been going on? Captain Dunaway asked. 
Does it matter if it's a day, a month, or a year? I've been in Korea for 9 months now, so it could have been going on the entire time I've been over here. We purchased a house a year ago, so I don't think it was going on any longer than that since I was at home every weekend. But now I'm wondering how many others have there been. Hell, is Danny even my son? They talked for another 30 minutes until Grant was calm enough to return to the office and address his staff. It was the most humiliating and embarrassing thing he had ever done, and they were embarrassed for him. Shortly after his address to the staff, Grant thanked them for coming in and dismissed them for the day. If they could not pass the IG inspection by now, they never would. The next week was typical of these types of inspections. Similar to an audit in the private sector, an IG inspection is every bit as invasive as a colonoscopy. Everything you have done and every decision you have made is called into question and has to be responded to politely and clearly. The result was that they passed the IG inspection, and it was time to turn over command to LTC Keel's replacement, Lieutenant Colonel Kiana Cardwell. Grant had known Kiana for several years, and knew she was a fine officer, and an excellent attorney, and the JAG staff would be in good hands. The only person other than Grant not staying in Korea with Colonel Cardwell was Captain Lynn Dunaway. She would be traveling with him to Fort Cavazos in Texas, where he would outprocess his active duty and enter the Army Reserve, and she would report to her new duty station with the JAG office at Three Corps. Grant felt that he owed Captain Dunaway a great debt. In the weeks following the discovery of his wife's cheating, she provided a shoulder to cry on and moral support as he outprocessed, leaving the only full-time employment he had ever known. Randy Kane was in a sour mood as he walked toward his truck. He had begun his day with a leisurely duck, with his girlfriend riding him until they both finished. Girlfriend he snorted to himself. Yeah, right. After Cat had finished, she rolled off and lay next to Randy as they caught their breath. I'm going to miss this, she sighed. The comment annoyed Randy. We don't have to stop. You can divorce him and marry me you know. I'd marry you in an instant if you said yes. Cat stiffened next to Randy. I've told you that's not happening. I love my husband. When he gets out of the army, I am going to spend the rest of my life making it up to him for a little fling. When Grant comes home, you and I will see each other in the hallway at school or the cafeteria, smile, and say hello. I'll keep teaching science, and you'll keep coaching and we can be friends. But I love my husband, and nothing is going to break up my marriage. Randy barked out a bitter laugh. If you love him so much, why am I in your bed? Is it because the sex is so much better with me? If that's the reason, can you really live with going back to the same old, same old? Kat shook her head. The sex with you is not better than with Grant's. It's different, but not necessarily better. He still makes my toes curl, just like he did that first time in Sydney. Randy grimaced at that statement. Kat had met her husband Grant at the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney, Australia. Kat had played on the US women's volleyball team, and Grant had been on the US fencing team. Kat was a senior in college, while Grant was a first lieutenant in the army, participating in their world-class athlete program that provided an opportunity for service members to participate in sports while on active duty. Kat and Grant had met at the Olympic Village and had developed an immediate attraction. The atmosphere at the Olympic Village was a seething cauldron of sexuality as young, in shape, attractive athletes mingled with each other. Kat and Grant found themselves in bed together within two hours of meeting and had been together ever since. The fact that Kat was from Dallas, Texas, and Grant was raised an hour away in Ferguson, Texas, cemented their relationship. The US women's volleyball team had failed to medal in the Olympics, but Grant had medaled twice, a silver medal for individual saber, and a bronze medal for team saber. Kat had explained to Randy that her husband preferred the more aggressive fencing style of the saber, since you could score by slashing and cutting, and not just by touching, as with the foil and the pay. Randy had just looked at her blankly. When Kat had first told Randy that her husband had been a world-class fencer, Randy had pictured some guy who was really good at using a post-hole digger, and was confused as to why she was bragging about him. After finding out what fencing was, oh, like Zorro, and that it was a real sport, Randy found himself annoyed and jealous, that not only was Grant married to an absolute smoke show like Kat, but that he was an Olympic medalist as well. While those two had been cavorting at the Olympic Village, Randy had been in middle school trying to get bolt up for high school ball. After playing high school, and then college football for Arkansas, the 6'6 and 265-pound defensive lineman had not been drafted by any team. He was signed to the practice squad of the Detroit Lions as a walk-on, but was released after one year. He was then signed as a practice squad walk-on by Buffalo but was released after three weeks. Realizing his NFL career was headed nowhere, he signed on to play with the Ottawa Renegades in the Canadian Football League, but was released halfway through their season. Randy then pivoted to coaching and quickly worked his way up the ranks of high school coaches, culminating with Ferguson's win over Lubbock for the Texas 6-8 championship. 
After his win, several colleges had reached out to Randy about joining their coaching staff, and he felt that he was in a good place, although most of the job offers were contingent upon bringing Danny Keel with him. If he could only talk Cat into divorcing Soldier Boy and marrying him, life would be perfect. Randy figured he had three months for a full court press to talk Cat into leaving her husband and marrying him. After that, her husband would be retired and back home. Cat had indicated that there might be the possibility of eventually restarting their affair, but that is all it would ever be. Danny would be starting college in the fall and wouldn't be underfoot like he had been before. Catching his coach and his mom in bed together wasn't that a near disaster. Cad and Randy thought Danny was out for the day, and after a particularly athletic bout of sex, Randy had walked wearing nothing into Cat's kitchen to fetch water for them both. Danny had been sitting at the table in the breakfast nook and had watched as Randy, his clock swinging, wet and shiny from being in his mother, sauntered into the kitchen as if he owned it. Danny had started for the coach with fist raised, but before Danny could do anything, Randy had performed a leg sweep, causing Danny to land hard on the kitchen floor, nearly blacking out as the back of his head hit hard against the stone flooring. Hearing the ruckus, Kat had thrown on her robe and rushed into the kitchen in time to see Danny struggling to his feet. She had placed herself between her lover and her son, and begged them to stop and to calm down. Kat assured her son that what she had with Randy was only a fling, and would have no bearing on her marriage. She had begged Danny to not say a word to his father, since it would destroy him. Danny would be responsible for his parents' divorce and his father's devastation, and his silence was necessary for his parents' marriage and his father's mental health. Danny had angrily agreed to keep quiet and during the intervening months, seemed to have gradually accepted the affair, and could, on occasion even joke with his mother and Randy about their relationship, although over the last couple of weeks, Randy had noticed a chill in the air when he was around Danny. Randy had to admit that he was partially to blame for things going south. On a couple of occasions, after leaving Kat's bedroom, Randy had made comments implying what a great piece of meat Kat was. Randy was big enough to know that he should apologize for his comments and the smirks, but he had not got around to it yet. Things nearly went off the rails a couple of weeks ago when Danny entered his bedroom, only to find Randy looking at his trophies. I didn't know you practiced karate, Randy said. Danny had just looked at Randy and asked, what are you doing in my room? Randy had pointed at a framed certificate. I'm a black belt also. I've been taking karate since I was eight. Randy was hoping he could form a connection other than that of a coach and player with Danny. If Danny could see him as a mentor or stepdad, then maybe he would listen to Randy about changing colleges. Danny had politely asked Randy to leave his room. As Randy continued trying to chat with Danny about karate and martial arts, Danny interrupted Randy by saying with barely suppressed rage, Get the duck out of my room, you ducking asshole. Randy was about to retort back to Danny, but at the last minute pulled back. He didn't care about Danny's feelings, but he didn't want to cut himself off from Cat's kitty. Have you given any more thought toward changing Danny's mind about college? Cat rolled her eyes at Randy bringing this subject up once again. He's not going to change his mind. He's been planning this his whole life, and he's not going to change his mind at this late date. His father went there and that's where he's going. No one except a bunch of soldiers and sailors gives a sheep about watching army play navy. I don't understand why he wants to go to West Point when he can go to any D1 school in the country. It makes no sense to me. He plays at a top school, then he gets drafted into the NFL, and he's set for life. Unset by Randy was the thought that it could also vault him into a college coaching job, and maybe an NFL coaching job as well. All the better if Danny is his stepson, but his future could be set even if things didn't pan out with Cat. After all, she was 10 years older than Randy, and while he did love her, Danny could hold the key to Randy's future, not his mother. More to shut Randy up than because of any feeling of desire for him, Cat leaned over and took Randy's clock into her mouth. He groaned and relaxed back into his pillow and forgot about football for a minute. As Randy rounded the front of his truck after exiting Cat's house, he noticed the driver's front tire was flat. Ducky thought, this could not have happened on a worse day. Randy was already running a bit late due to Cat's last minute blue job, and now the thought of changing a flat pissed him off. Today was the scheduled pep rally for the revealing and hanging of the state championship banner. The entire football team and coaching staff would be faded and fawned over, and Randy's role was to deliver a short speech and then introduce each player, relating a fun fact about them. Reporters would be in attendance, and Randy looked at the event as another way to increase his coaching profile. As Randy squatted next to his flat tire, he felt, rather than saw someone behind him, before he felt something strike him in the back. The blow did not pain him at first, but it did knock him to his knees, after which the intense pain began. Randy was able to turn around and look up to his attacker who he saw was wearing a black hoodie, dark wraparound sunglasses, and a black N95 COVID mask, effectively concealing their identity. 
he saw his assailant bring the aluminum baseball bat back, and then time seemed to slow as Randy saw the bat swing forward. Randy was able to read the manufacturer's name of Easton in large letters on the barrel of the bat, and below that the phrase V5 Pro Big Barrel, as he watched the bat head for his face in slow motion. He saw, rather than felt, the bat hit his jaw, but mercifully, the impact rendered him unconscious, so Randy did not feel the destruction of the left side temporomandibular joint, as the mandible and temporal bone, known collectively as the jaw hinge, separated as they, along with the entirety of the left side of his jawbone, were pulverized into small bits and powder by the force of the swing. Neither did Randy feel the impact as the aluminum bat struck his testicles twice, destroying one and badly damaging the other. Nor did Randy feel the bat strike the patella of each knee, as the kneecaps were shattered, and the underlying bones and tendons badly damaged. This was followed by strikes to the humeral nerve joints of the elbow, the damage of which ensured that for the remainder of his life, supporting his weight during the missionary sexual position, would be Randy's least favorite way to have sex, on those few occasions when he would in fact, be able to have sex. The unknown attacker then grabbed a bicycle that had been parked in the landscaped area of the cul de sac across from the keel house, hopped on, and pedaled swiftly away from the scene. As Kat hurriedly backed out of her garage late for the pep rally, she was surprised to see Randy's pickup truck still parked on the street in front of her house. Her home was located at the end of the cul de sac and saw little traffic, so she had never worried about Randy parking his truck in front of the house. Her three car garage housed her Lexus, Danny's Camaro, and Grant's Lincoln SUV so the street was the only place for his Dodge Ram with its oversized tires and raised suspension. As she backed into the street, she glanced at his truck and was startled to see Randy lying in the street. Thinking he may have fallen or had a heart attack, Kat threw her car into park and ran to assist Randy. As she ran up to him, she saw the unnatural position of his arms and legs, and as she took in his face with the jaw hanging loose and unattached, she screamed, and the world seemed to go hazy for a moment. Coming to her senses, Kat grabbed her phone and called 911. She then had the presence of mind to call the high school, and explain that neither she nor Coach Kane would be in that day. Detectives Mann and Lucas sat next to each other on the sofa in Cat Keel's living room, after declining her offer of coffee. Hopefully this won't take long, Mrs. Keel, the male half of the pair, Detective Mann said. What was the purpose of Coach Kane's visit so early this morning? Cat had flushed crimson at the question. He stayed the night, she said quietly while looking down at her hands which were clutched together in her lap. The detectives glanced at each other, and then Mann asked the obvious follow-up question. Are you involved in a sexual relationship with Coach King? Kat had nodded her head as tears leaked from her eyes. How long have you been involved with Coach King? Approximately nine months, Kat answered in a new whisper. Does your husband currently reside here? Detective Lucas, the female half of the duo, asked. My husband is stationed at Camp Humphrey in Korea, Kat sobbed. He's due to retire in three months and return home. At that, Kat had to pause the interview to take a couple of deep breaths. Is he aware of your relationship with Coach King? Oh no. He must never know about my affair. It would kill him. This whole situation needs to be kept from him, Kat implored pleadingly. Mrs. Keel, we're going to have to interview your husband. A man was severely beaten after leaving the house which he co-owns with you. There is absolutely no way of keeping this situation from him, Detective Lucas said. There was a long pause as Kat began sobbing loudly and left to gather herself. When she returned, a box of tissues in hand, the detectives resumed their questioning. Mrs. Keel, are you sure your husband is in Korea? Could he have returned to the United States? No, that's impossible. If Grant was in the US he would be here. My husband loves me too much to stay away from our home. Kat pulled out her iPhone and tapped the screen. See? He's still in Korea. The Apple Find My Phone clearly showed her husband's phone as being in Korea. Man and Lucas looked at each other thinking the same thing. All that proved was that his phone was in Korea. Mrs. Keel, who else lives in the house with you? My son Danny, Kat replied. Could he have attacked Coach King? Detective Man asked. No, that's not possible. I heard his car leave about 30 minutes before Randy was attacked, and I know he was at the school pep rally at the time. My son has a good relationship with Randy. He was Danny's coach in football. Detective Mann was aware of the fact that Randy Kane was Danny's football coach. Ferguson winning the state title was a huge deal for the city, and Danny's performance was already legendary. Mann had been to the game and had watched Kat kiss Randy on the sidelines. Everyone had assumed she was the coach's wife or girlfriend. No one knew that she was another man's wife. Was your son aware of your relationship with Coach Kane? Lucas asked. Yes. He wasn't happy about it at first, but he came to accept it. I explained to him that it would not affect my marriage to his father, and he accepted that. Man and Lucas shot each other a look at that statement. 
How delusional was this woman? The look seemed to say. Mrs. Keel, I noticed you have a doorbell camera. Can we see the video? Kat looked at the detectives in surprise. I forgot all about that. I have the app on my iPad. Kat grabbed her device off an end table and tapped the screen a few times before handing it over to Detective Man. Just hit play. The detectives watched as Randy Kane exited the Keel house and walked around the front of his truck, where he apparently noticed a flat tire. Kane's truck obstructed their view of the events, but from what they could tell, as he was squatting to look at the tire, a tall thin figure rushed towards Kane from across the street. The figure was wearing a black hoodie, wraparound sunglasses, and a COVID mask. The attacker brought the bat down several times before jumping on a bicycle and pedaling away, with the bat tucked under their arm. The video was a nothing burger. You could not determine if the attacker was male or female, much less the identity. They would have the video enhanced, but it was already a high-definition recording, so probably not much to be gained from that. Man asked for and received permission from Kat to send the recording to his police email. Mrs. Keel, Detective Man began, with a hard emphasis on the word Mrs. Can you think of anyone that might have the motivation to attack Coach Kane in such a violent manner? No, Kat sobbed. I can't think of anyone that would do something so horrible. I don't understand why anyone would attack Randy. He didn't deserve that. Grant Keel was sitting at the dining table in his brother's house, filling out the paperwork that his divorce attorney had requested when the doorbell rang. Betty Lou, his sister-in-law answered the door and shouted to Grant that he had visitors. He arrived at the door to find two people, a man and a woman holding badges identifying themselves as detectives from the Ferguson Police Department. May we come in? The male half asked. Grant looked at Betty Lou who shrugged her shoulders, so he invited the officers in and directed them towards the living room. The detectives took in the tall, slim woman and were suitably impressed. Betty Lou Keel stood an inch under six feet tall and weighed approximately 150 pounds. Her raven hair was cut into a stylish, asymmetrical bob that was longer on the right side than the left. There was a streak of grey hair on her right side in the front that highlighted the piercing blue of her eyes. Her nose had a bump in the center and was slightly off-center, as if it had been broken at least once, and there was a barely noticeable two-inch scar that ran from the corner of her left eye downward. She was a visually striking woman. Grant Keel was striking as well. An inch over six feet tall and 180 pounds, Grant had the slim build of a runner. But in their research, the detectives had learned that he was not a runner but a fencer, a passion that had carried him to the 2000 Sydney Olympics, and a sport with which he was still active. Keel's dark hair was beginning to show grey at the temples, and his blue eyes were kind but sad. Detective Lucas could feel herself responding to Grant Keel. Do we call you Mr. Keel or Lieutenant Colonel Keel? Asked the male, who identified himself as Detective Man. Mr. is fine. Or you can call me Grant. Or you can call me Colonel. I was recently promoted to full colonel, but I don't usually stand on formalities. Promoted. It was our understanding that you were retiring, Detective Man said. From active duty. I'm in the reserves. Monthly meetings in two weeks in the summer and hopefully hang around long enough to get a star, Grant said. Detective Lucas nodded. Very nice, she thought. Brenda Lucas had been an army MP leaving with the enlisted rank of E4. The man in front of her was an Olympic medalist, an attorney, a full colonel, and had the goal of attaining the rank of Brigadier General. Kat Keel was a goddamned idiot, she thought. We'll stick with Mr. Keel for now. I'm sure you know why we're here. I have a good idea, Grant replied. Someone beat the hell out of the man who was sleeping with my wife, and you think that it was me? Was it you? Asked the female half who had identified herself as Detective Lucas. No matter how I answer, I'm still going to be considered a person of interest, so I'll just keep my mouth shut about that question, Grant replied. Can you tell us where you were three mornings ago at 7.30 a.m.? 7.30. I was working out with my brother. He's combined a couple of the bedrooms into one large room, and has outfitted them as a gym, so every morning we work out together from around 7.30 until late 30 or so. After that, he takes a shower, goes into his home office, and logs into his job since he works remotely. I go into the guest room, take a shower, and then get started with some of the things I'm currently working on. Any witnesses other than your brother? Detective Man asked. No, just him. Betty Lou, my sister-in-law leaves the house shortly before we work out to go to her job, so it's just the two of us. When was the last time you were at your house? The one where your wife and son live and where the attack on Randy Kane took place? About a week ago, Grant answered. I stopped by when no one was home to pick up some clothes and some paperwork from my files. I didn't disturb anything of my wife's or Coach Kane's. You knew they were having an affair? Detective Lucas asked. I did. You seem pretty calm and detached about it. 
I've come to accept her actions and the end of my marriage. It is what it is. Until about two hours ago, she thought you were still in the army and stationed in Korea. When we advised her that you had left Korea a month ago and were living with your brother, she didn't believe us. She saw your location was still at Camp Humphrey. She called your office and they told her you had out processed from Korea several weeks previously. Your wife had a meltdown when she found that out. Hysterics, screaming, the works. We had to call for an ambulance, and the EMTs had to sedate her. Grant shrugged his shoulders. I would say that she's Coach Kane's problem and he can look after her, but from what I read about his condition, he's not in any kind of shape to do that. As far as my location, I forgot my phone and left it on the charger on my credenza in my office. The officer that replaced me is having it shipped to me. The detectives had a skeptical look on their faces as Detective Mann said, that was awfully convenient, wasn't it? Grant shrugged his shoulders again and ignored the question. Leland, Grant's brother, chose that moment to exit his home office, and paused as he saw Grant speaking with the detectives. They think you did it, Leland asked. Grant nodded his head. They haven't accused me yet, but they're easing into it by coming at me sideways. They were about to ask me how I knew about my wife's affair, and why I didn't tell her that I was back in Ferguson. From there they'll probably ask you about my alibi, and then they'll try to arrest me for first-degree felony assault, before realizing that they have no evidence and no case. Then they'll get frustrated with me and tell me not to leave town before they leave to go annoy someone else. Sounds about right, Leland agreed. The two detectives had been staring at Grant and Leland in disbelief, as they calmly discussed what actions the detectives would be taking, their heads swiveling back and forth like someone watching a tennis match as Betty Lou Keel looked on in amusement. How do you know what we're thinking? Detective Mann asked, looking at them suspiciously. I was an army JAG officer. I've overseen more investigations than you can imagine. My brother was an army SID agent before retiring and opening his own security company. We know what you're thinking before you think it. Detective Mann had an annoyed look on his face at the thought of his game plan being so transparent. If you know all the questions, then by all means, please answer them. Grant looked steadily at Mann. I knew about my wife's affair because I saw her making out with Kane after the state championship game. I'm sure you've seen the video. Man nodded, he has seen the video of the kiss. Everyone assumed it was Randy Kane's girlfriend, but in the wake of the attack, word was starting to filter out who the identity of the woman was. I didn't tell her I was back in Ferguson because I don't want to see her. I'm working with a divorce attorney, and I didn't want to hear her attempts at justification for her actions or her trying to blame me. And your son? Man asked. You haven't contacted him either. You saw his interaction with Kane and my wife. I did. He didn't seem bothered by it. Grant nodded his head. Doesn't seem that we have much to talk about, does it? So, Detective Lucas said, do you have an alibi? Should we show them the recordings? Leland Keel asked. Grant nodded. This seems like a good time. What recordings? What do you have recordings of? Leland excused himself for a minute and returned with an iPad. He pointed the TV remote control at the 60-inch wall-mounted flat screen. As the TV powered up, he mirrored the iPad S to the TV screen and hit play. I have cameras around the house, including the hallway, the front door, and the backyard. This is the video from this morning. The TV screen displayed six different camera feeds. A doorbell camera faced the street, another camera faced outward toward the backyard, and a third camera was located in the garage. The remaining three cameras displayed the kitchen, living room, and the hall which contained the bedrooms. This was the feed at 7.22 this morning. They watched as Betty Lou exited her bedroom wearing a white blouse, black pencil skirt, and black heels, dressed for her job as CFO of a medical services company. The camera caught her walking down the hall, losing her as she neared the end of the hallway. The living room camera then picked her up as she walked through that room before being lost, and then picked up by the kitchen camera. That camera lost her as she exited into the garage. The dark garage was suddenly illuminated as the garage door raised, and the camera picked her up as they watched her enter her Lexus SUV. Betty Lou backed out of the garage, and the camera was able to follow her SUV as it backed into the street. At the same time, the doorbell camera picked up a side view of her vehicle as she entered the street before the garage door lowered. Leland froze the image by pressing pause. You can see by the timestamp that this image was taken at 7.25 this morning. Leland then tapped the screen a few times advancing the image to 7.28. This is me and Grant. They watched a video of Grant and Leland approaching a room in the hall from different directions. Grant was wearing a red hoodie and red sweepings, while Leland was wearing the same thing, a red hoodie and red sweepings. I'm coming from my bedroom and Grant is coming from the guest room, Leland explained. Grant entered the room first, followed by Leland. 
We can sit here and watch an empty hall for an hour, or I can fast forward an hour, you call, Leland said, looking at the two detectives. Fast forward it, detective man said. Leland tapped the screen several times and froze the screen as Grant and Leland emerged from the room at 8.26. They had worked out for 58 minutes. This is the video from yesterday, Leland said. The video was nearly identical to the video of today's activities, with the exception that the times were a couple of minutes off, and Betty Lou, instead of wearing a pencil skirt, was wearing a stylish woman's black pantsuit with heels. Grant and Leland, again came from opposite ends of the hall, meeting at the door to the home gym wearing matching sweatsuits, this time grey. They again stayed in the gym for an hour. Leland tapped the iPad screen a couple of times bringing up another set of screens. This is the same video recordings, but on the morning that the ass hole was attacked. They again saw Betty Lou exit her bedroom, but instead of being dressed for work, she was wearing workout gear consisting of a thin black hoodie, black exercise tights, and white tennis shoes. I took a day off to train because I'm competing in a triathlon in a couple of weeks. Today was a bike day and I rode the bike path around Ferguson Park four times, Betty Lou explained. They watched as Betty Lou backed her SUV out of the garage, and noticed that this time, there were bicycles and the bike carrier attached to the rear deck of her SUV. As they continued to watch the recording, they saw Leland exit his bedroom wearing a black hoodie and black sweepings, and a couple of seconds later, Grant exited the guest room, also wearing a black hoodie and black sweepings. The detectives looked at each other in disbelief. Are you fin kidding me? Asked Detective Lucas. Are you three for real? Do you expect us to believe that it's a complete coincidence that the three of you are wearing the same type of clothes that Kane's assailant wore on the day he was attacked? Leland and Grant shrugged at the same time. We're going to let the recording speak for itself, Grant replied. Leland said, I'm not going to fast forward the recording, but I am going to play it at double speed so you can watch. Before I do that though, can I get you two a cup of coffee or anything? Even at double speed, we're going to be sitting here for a half hour twiddling our thumbs. After bringing everyone a cup of coffee, Leland again hit play, and the five watched the counter count down. After 25 minutes, Leland stopped playing the video at double time and began playing it in real time. The brothers exited the room at 8.31 and walked to their respective rooms, still in their hoodies. That's the day in question. As you can see, neither one of us left that room. I'll make the recordings available to you without a warrant. Can you show us the gym? The detectives did not look convinced about Grant's alibi. Of course, Leland said. The officers followed him into the hallway, glancing over their shoulders at the dark globe, concealing the ceiling-mounted camera that captured the hall. They looked around the room containing the gym and then at each other. The home gym was a large room that had been formed by combining three bedrooms and eliminating the closets and storage. Half of the room consisted of free weights, benches, an extensive dumbbell set, and kettlebells. It also contained a rowing machine and an elliptical. The other half of the room had been converted into a small dojo. Shelves had been built into one wall and held several trophies. There were also framed photos of Leland and Betty Lou fighting opponents in the ring in mixed martial arts competition. In one of the photos, Betty Lou Keel was shown having her arm raised in victory by the referee, as her opponent stood by dazedly as she was supported by her coach. Betty Lou had blood streaming down her face and from her nose. Her left eye was puffy and swollen closed, and her nose appeared to be broken, and had shifted slightly to the side. Well, what Detective Lucas said softly and slowly as she looked with admiration at the photograph of Betty Lou. Your wife is a badass. You'd better believe she is, Leland Keel said with obvious pride. And for way more reasons than just this, he said as he waved his hand toward the photos and trophies. She's fiercely loyal to her family and friends and is the best woman I've ever known. She's one of a kind, and I will never get tired of letting her know that. Grant nodded his head sadly. At one time, he had thought the same thing about his wife, but thinking back, Kat was never like Betty Lou. She never had that intense loyalty. What about the windows? Detective Lucas asked. There were ordinary house windows in the room with wooden blinds that were currently in the open position. Are you asking if I could have snuck out during the middle of a workout and attacked Coach King? Grant asked. You could have. Or he could have, Detective Mann said, pointing first at Grant and then at Leland. That's true, Leland said but we didn't. Can you prove that? Can you prove that you didn't sneak out? Detective Lucas asked in an aggressive tone. Detective Leland said, that's not the right question. Yeah. Well, what's the right question? Detective Lucas asked, her annoyance obvious. The right question is, can you prove that we did sneak out? Grant answered. I'll show you two out now, Leland added. Colonel Cardwell, how may I help you? Colonel Cardwell, I understand you are the officer in charge of the JAG office at Camp Humphrey. That is correct. Who's calling please? 
Colonel, my name is Detective Brenda Lucas with the Ferguson Police Department in Ferguson, Texas. I'm calling about your predecessor Colonel Grant Keel. Oh, yes how is Grant? He was fine the last time I saw him. Colonel Cardwell, Colonel Keel told us that he left his cell phone in his office in Korea. Yes, he did. It was on the charger on the credenza in what used to be his office. I didn't know where to send it so I hung on to it. A few days ago, he called me with an address in which to ship it, which I did. Colonel, what day did he contact you with the address? This past Monday. He also told me to answer any questions about him that anyone who calls may have. It sounds like Grant was anticipating some trouble coming his way, Colonel Cardwell said. Great, Lucas thought. The day of the attack when he no longer cares if his wife knew he was in town, is when he has his phone shipped back. Detective Lucas thanked Cardwell and then immediately called Grant Keel. I spoke to Colonel Cardwell and she verified what you claimed about your cell phone. She also stated that she shipped it to you. Colonel Cardwell is very efficient. If she said she shipped it out on a certain day, you can bet your pension that she did. Colonel, I want to be the one to open that package. I want to see your cell phone before anyone else. I don't have a warrant and you are within your rights to say no, but this will go a long way towards establishing your innocence. There was a long pause on the other end of the phone before Keep replied. I don't guess I have a problem with that since I don't have anything to hide. I'll call you when it arrives. If she shipped it out on Monday, it should be here in a day or so. During their canvassing of the neighborhood around Leland Keel's home, the detectives discovered the house across the street from Leland Keel had a doorbell camera that faced the Keel's home. When asked, the homeowner Bobby Lee Gearson stated that yes, his doorbell camera took video, and yes it was stored on the cloud. The detectives felt they were getting their first break in the case, and sat down with Gearson to review the recording. Because the houses were catty-cornered from each other, Leland Keel's doorbell camera was angled to capture his own driveway, but recorded only the side of Gearson's house. Gearson's camera, on the other hand, was angled to provide the perfect view of the Keel's home. Bobby Lee Gearson was a fire department captain who had a sideline in designing fire suppression equipment. He had several patents and had licensed his designs to several companies. He had a machine shop attached to the rear of his house with a CNC table, milling equipment, lathes, and cutters. He was divorced and for a hobby practiced martial arts and held a black belt in karate. There was a clear shot of the entirety of the Keel house, including the windows in the home gym for the day of the attack on Randy King. At approximately 7.15, the video showed Bobby Lee Gearson, wearing a black hoodie, black sweepants, and white tennis shoes carrying yard tools from his garage to the front porch, including a rake, hoe, and shovel. As they watched, Gearson leaned his tools against the wall containing the doorbell camera. They watched in disbelief as he leaned the shovel with the blade up and handle down, rather than with the shovel blade down and handle up like any normal person would have done. The shovel completely covered the camera and continued to so do for over an hour, until Gearson retrieved his tools and started spreading mulch around his house. What in the ever-loving duck did I just see, man had shouted to Gearson. He blocked the camera, Detective Lucas said, dismayed. I was going to start spreading mulch, so I brought my tools out and leaned them against the wall, but then I started feeling a little queasy, so I went back inside and sat on the sofa and rested for a while. When I started feeling better, I went back outside and finished my mulching. And I guess it was just a coincidence that you were wearing a black hoodie and black sweepants. Detective Lucas asked, derisively. They must be really good friends for you to put yourself at risk of an aiding and abetting charge, man said, bitterly. Leland and Betty Lou. Well, Betty Lou is my sister, and I've known Leland and Grant for like forever, so I'm sorry, what was your question again? As soon as Grant handed her the package, Detective Lucas tore through the box to get to Keel's iPhone, before pressing the power button which did nothing. Dead battery, thought Lucas to herself. Can I borrow this for a couple of days? She asked. Take your time, Grant replied. After charging the phone at the station, Lucas and Man huddled around the phone waiting for it to boot up. Lucas had an iPhone and had always side-eyed Man's Android and the green text bubbles that came from him. Man sat back and waited for his partner to do her thing. Once the phone powered up, the phone started buzzing as texts and missed calls started loading up. Lucas opened Imessage, Apple's native texting platform, and started going down the list. There was a normal number of texts from Kat to her husband, the usual I love you and miss you type, which was ridiculous, knowing how flagrantly she was cheating on her husband. After Kane's attack, Kat's texts had ramped up, and she had sent a sheep ton over the last few days, as her situation was starting to catch up with her. There were a couple from his brother, but the real surprise was the number of texts from Lynn Dunaway. The detectives knew that Captain Dunaway had worked with Grant in Korea and was now assigned to Fort Cavazos. The text was friendly with no hint of romance. 
They were mostly checking in with each other, and to make sure she was adapting to a new posting, and her making sure he was recovering from finding out about his wife's affair. They also discussed Kiel's finding about his wife's affair in the most emasculating way imaginable. Having your entire office staff see his wife jump into the arms of her lover, and kiss him in front of the entire school. Ouch. They read Danny's text to his father immediately after his game and Grant's response. There were a couple more how's it going? Type texts before they came across a video that Danny had sent to his dad, his uncle Leland, and Betty Lou, and her brother Bobby Lee. The video was self-taken of Danny standing in front of a mirror, and it was day 10 times stamped a week before the attack. In the video, Danny said, the pep rally for the banner presentation is next Monday at 9am. I hope you can make it, but I'll understand if each of you is too busy. I'll talk to you soon. Poor kid, the detectives thought. He sounded so down, and his dad's family was cutting him out of their lives for keeping his mother's affair a secret. Explain this to me like I'm five, man said. He hasn't had his phone for over a month, but I can see that he's been responding to texts from his kid and his wife the whole time. What's up with that? Assuming he doesn't have another phone, then he either has an iPad or a Mac since to his iPhone with his Ziklet account. He can respond to text, and the other person doesn't know they're not coming from his iPhone. The iPhone location shows Korea, and he's a mile away at his brother's house, sending them texts. Duck. Me, replied detective man. His family thinks he's in Korea, meanwhile he's in town making moves and getting his divorce going. Yeah, but so what? Where does that get us? Nowhere, except knowing he's a sneaky bustard. That's it for part 1, friends. Who do you think did it? Let me know in the comments. Be honest though, you don't care who did it, as long as Randy got what was coming to him, do you?